Hi, I'm uh, Ferdinand de Jong, and I'm a member of the local organizing committee. And I have the honor of introducing to you Sharon McDonald. Um, my research on um, Sharon's career revealed the, follow revealed the following detail. Sharon McDonald has been interested in museums ever since she was accidentally locked into the Bit Rivers Museum whilst a student at Oxford University. And I must say, this is not from the website, but it says, but I think that when liberated, she continued to study, nonetheless, uh, anthropology at the University of Oxford, where she obtained her doctorate. Um, Sharon has conducted research on a variety of areas with a focus on museums and heritage, in particular on post-reunification Germany, Research that, has pub that was published in the monograph Difficult Heritage, Negotiating the Nazi Past in Nuremberg and Beyond, published in uh, 2009. And I think the concept of difficult heritage that is at the core of this work had never acquired such wide purchase in, in heritage studies if it, if it wasn't for her work on the subject. She went on to examine the memory boom in Europe and her subsequent monograph, Memory Lands, Heritage and Identity Today, looks at how Europe has become a memory land littered with um, material reminders of the past and how this memory phenomenon is related to the changing nature of, of identities. A theme that is of obvious relevance today and I, I won't say especially in Britain. Um, other publications include the four-volume International Handbooks in Museum Studies um, as a joint uh, editor. And this is just a selection of the many, of the many, um, of the very impressive publication records that, uh, that, that Sharon has. She is now Alexander von Humboldt's Professor of Social Anthropology with special reference to museums and heritage studies at the Humboldt University at Berlin, where she has established the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage, or CARMA. The center works with a wide range of museums and heritage institutions in Berlin and elsewhere. And I've decided not to include the very many projects that she has been involved in and is still involved with. Um, so today we have the pleasure of welcoming Sharon to the uh, ASA and to give this plenary called Castles in the Air and on the Ground, Utopian Worlding and Troubling Temporalities in Heritage Making. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sharon MacDonald. Thank you, thank you so much, Ferdinand, for that lovely introduction. And I'd like to begin as... Actually, I wish I'd got a, a story to tell about you. Oh. Um, I'd like to begin as well by just really thanking the organisers of the conference. Um, I think it's been, yeah, just tremendous, really, really stimulating uh, conference. It's quite hard coming at this point in the conference because my head's so full of all sorts of things that I want to talk about. So I'm going to try uh, not to add those in. And thanks as well to the Nomadit team, who, as ever, just do such a, a phenomenal uh, job. And, of course, behind all this, the, the ASA committee and uh, so, so on. Now, I wanted to begin, actually, with a, a little bit of um, personal troubling temporality, which is that this isn't my first ASA conference at UEA. Um, I was here for the ASA um, in here. You're looking baffled. There was, honestly, there was. Uh, the, gosh, I hope I haven't got this wrong. This could be really embarrassing. Um, the ASA in 1987. Actually, if I've got it wrong, it doesn't matter. It's something about memory, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Raymond Firth was here. Raymond Firth was here. Yeah, so both the Sirs jousting in their particular way. Um, and, um, yeah, so Mar Marilyn Strathern was here. I don't know if anybody else was here from then. You were, of course, Stephen, <laughs> right. 
You were, Jeanette. Brilliant. <laughs> well, that, yeah, so others who've got long temporalities. But I want, oh, Judith, oh, more and more. <laughs> anyway, do you remember this? Do you remember, remember this? So afterwards, Richard Farden wrote up a really wonderful report in Anthropology Today, and I, I have to read this particular bit to you. He writes, 27 papers, papers, 27 papers in two days <laughs> was a tough course. <laughs> he says, and one that the annual meeting wisely decided should not be attempted again. <laughs> what happened? What happened in between? What happened? Um, that must tell us something about conference temporalities as well as about maybe about resolutions and anticipated futures. So I have to say that one of my own distinct memories of that, that conference as well as that jousting, as actually Richard Farden put it, between the, the Sir Raymond and Sir Edmund, um, one of my memories is one that I've repeated in this conference and I expect that m many of you have, which is trying to get from one part of the campus to another, um, I'm pretty much sure that the same building work is still going on. <laughs> um, but I especially recall one moment when a group of us kind of pottered along, um, only to realize that what we'd done was followed Ronnie Frankenberg, who is another ASA stalwart of the time, into an area for the storage of, of, of rubbish bins. Whereupon Ronnie kind of turned around and he said, you shouldn't follow me. Um, because I have no sense of direction whatsoever. And then he continued, that is, of course, the mark of a good anthropologist, no sense of direction. <laughs> so maybe there's an allegory there, or maybe a warning. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, for you to decide. Now, the conference at that time, just as a little tiny bit more on that, um, was history and ethnicity so very relevant, actually, for this particular um, theme of the conference on utopia and temporalities. For me, there's a little bit of further um, personal biography entangled in that, um, in that the content of the conference was shaped by Elizabeth Tonkin, Marion MacDonald, and Malcolm Chapman, um, who then later edited that, that volume of that name. And all of those had studied um, with Edwin Ardner at Oxford, who was uh, my doctoral supervisor at the time. Uh, very sadly, that was uh, Edwin's uh, last conference because he died unexpectedly a few months later. But I wanted to just pay a little bit of homage to actually some really subtle thinking uh, in that book. And um, partly what I wrote here was originally written in a sort of conversation with that, but that's ended up a little bit silenced in the final, final version. Anyway, now I'll properly begin. So right now, um, in the centre of Berlin, a castle is nearing completion. It is surely a funny time to build a castle. Aren't castles from the olden days of jousting knights and multiple petty despots, from times when you needed to surround yourself with a moat and pull up the drawbridge to keep out the marauding hordes? Hmm, maybe it isn't so untimely after all. <laughs> Maybe it is just the thing for the globally challenging future that faces us. Certainly, if we look around the world right now, there's lots of building of walls going on and aspirations to do so. There's battening down the hatches, securing the borders, severing connections, hunkering and bunkering down. Alongside bolstering the bunkering is a proliferation of rose-tinted looking back a waxing of ro romantic nostalgia for times imagined as more ordered, known, stable and secure, for times when people knew their place and stayed there, for times when it looked uh, like everyday life could keep chugging along without irritating incursions of cultural difference or imminent catastrophe on the horizon. There's even a simmering wistfulness that seems to be gaining increasing traction uh, for those dystopian utopia that nearly made it, if only Hitler hadn't taken things too far, if only those socialist totalitarian leaders hadn't been such personal hypocrites, 
If only imperialism and colonialism had managed to keep their fundamental decency. If only Britain had not so foolishly joined up with those continental foreigners, those Europeans, what a world we might be now in. What a world there could still be, perhaps. What potential the past holds for the future. Well, the official UN Global Challenges 2030 that this conference asks us to address uh, don't list reactionary uh, utopianism or xenophobic nostalgia. Actually, I was very good. I went and read these things. Um, I thought we had to talk about them. Anyway, they and the 17 sustainable development goals that we speakers should consider uh, don't mention the past, its deployment or effects at all. And that makes sense within the exclusively present and future temporal framing of these challenges and goals, with their emphasis on targets whose meeting or not it will be possible to assess. But actually that non-presence um, of the past and of history is also part of a disconnecting of the current situation with all of its histories and violence from, uh, from what led to it. So sustainable development's temporality is one of clear-cut forward focus without even a glance back. But ignoring history doesn't make it go away or stop it from tripping up or meeting worthy and uh, vital targets. Wars with roots in historic injustice and continuing grievances, as well as making great again nost nostalgic visions that promote viciously selective human hardship and ruinous environmental destruction, are just some of the most obvious ways in which the past or contemporary takes on it can interfere with sustainable developments, ambitions to head off climate catastrophe um, and, as mentioned in goal number 16, towards the end of the list, uh, to foster more peaceful and inclusive societies. But contemporary deployments of the past aren't all or aren't necessarily um, damaging. There are, if not utopian possibilities, and here maybe recall that Thomas More's um, use of the ut the term utopia plays with that homophone of you in the sense of good and you in the sense of no, so it's also no place, nowhere, kind of unattainable. So if not utopian possibilities to be found, there may be at least glimpses of hopeful potential. So the challenge is how to grapple uh, with intimations and deployments of the past in ways that can at least be less damaging and that might even contribute to crafting more equitable and livable futures. Um, so how then, this conference asks, are we as anthropologists to contribute to this? What can, what can we bring to the challenge? Well, by now a lot has been said and lots very, very uh, brilliantly. Um, so we've already heard lots of instances um, about how ethnography can highlight the effects of imperial continuities, how we can also um, detect alternatives and other modes, perhaps, of, of operating. But what I want to point to, in addition, is the potential of working in new constellations or maybe repurposed constellations of multiple expertise and engagement, um, and to possibilities perhaps, um, of scaling up processes, of injecting anthro interjecting anthropology's insights into wider uh, public domains. So the conference title um, expresses this in terms of perspectives. Um, it asks, what perspectives can anthropology bring to bear? So alongside trying to offer a few examples from some current projects that I'm involved in, I also wanted to probe a bit at that idea of perspectives and in a sort of semi-classical uh, anthropological fashion to try to do that via some reflections from, um, from field work from the field. Um, but because I think it might just get lost uh, in the detail, I thought I'd say up front uh, where I'm trying to get to with those points about perspectives. 
So, on the one hand, I want to argue that anthropology is a discipline that kind of deals in perspectives in some sense, that it's capable of detecting and articulating, and articulating both in the sense of um, speaking out or speaking in other registers, but also in that sense of, um, of bringing, bringing together. So of articulating diverse ways of seeing um, and including, importantly, um, ways of seeing and experiencing that go under the radar of uh, other disciplinary or especially maybe public policy uh, ways of seeing. And in saying that, I don't just have in mind kind of radically other um, ideas of perspective as we get with um, de Castro's perspectivism or the kind of thing that can be kind of panned out into uh, Descola's very, very nice fourfold scheme. That both of those authors point to deeply ontologically diverse modes of apprehending the world or of worlding um, is undoubtedly deeply stimulating and it's something we need to attend to and that, yeah, anthropologists are good at. But I want as well to keep hold of the idea of perspectives as sometimes entailing just, yeah, just little shifts in ways of seeing. And for anthropology, it's equally about um, quite subtle uh, differences of perspective as well as more dramatic ones. So little shifts matter too. At the same time though, I want to a little bit, <laughs> but not totally, <laughs> trying to play a careful game here, um, I want a little bit to resist the idea of or the assumption of perspectives as kind of free-floating add-ons um, that, that can be readily disconnectable um, and applicable elsewhere. So that, that model of transferability, it's wide, widespread and maybe increasingly so. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can be creatively um, deployed and insightful. So I, would, I don't want to fully rule it out, but it needs to be carefully curated, to use a term um, from, from my field. And too often, I think, anthropology kind of gets look, looks at as a kind of perspective prospecting, um, a sort of looking um, for other angles, um, and especially radical, radically other ones, that can then just be transferred from one context to another. And what that then overlooks is anthropology's concern with locating perspectives, getting where people are coming from. Um, and what's bound up uh, with that. So, I suppose it means, oh, lost my place, um, it overlooks the histories and the hidden baggage and entailments. In other words, perhaps, what lies behind the facades. And that brings me to my castle story that I promised back in my, um, in my title. Um, so the castle being built in Berlin, um, so in German it's referred to as the Schloss, and I have to confess that I, I went for the translation of castle because it let me have this, um, this word play <laughs> of castles in the air um, as a kind of utopia, so it seemed to work rather wonderfully. Um, the truth is it's probably better translated in this context as, um, as palace, but there we are. Um, oops. So what you see here are the being built, the freshly built facades um, that are facades um, of a former palace in a realisation um, that it's actually not, there was no single moment when it quite uh, looked like that because um, it refers particularly to um, uh, it, it in its state in the 18th century um, and, and has lasted, but with various changes through uh, until ar around 1950. So that palace is a reconstruction, but only partial of a palace with a longer history, back to the 15th century. Um, and while the facades, as you can see them here, they're Baroque in style, um, and I guess they only looked new, so new, uh, maybe in the 1700s, it also will have a dome with a very contested cross by the time it's finished, um, and that was only added in the mid-19th century. 
Um, and it's also not full reconstruction because the, there is also one side, the side that looks east or is looked at from the east, that is in rather unadorned modernist style. So the Chalos is then an architectural play of different time periods. It's also the site of various past and some present utopian visions. It was turned into the Baroque edifice um, that's now being resurrected under the monarchical and expansionist, um, uh, king, the monarchical and expansionist kingdom of Prussia, which achieved its uh, utopian ambition to create a unified German nation in 1871. I'll show you. Uh, a picture of, of it as it then looked in, in 1920. Uh, um, thereafter, the Schloss um, was the seat of the emperors of the German nation, and as such, in the late 19th and early 20th century of German colonialism in China, New Guinea, and Africa, and for earlier colonizing projects elsewhere, uh, especially South America. In addition, though, and it has so many currents, really, it was also a location for the contesting of that empire, most notably in November 1918, as part of the revolution that ended the monarchy and led to the establishment of the Weimar Republic. In World War II, the building um, was bombed, uh, hit by bombing. Um, most agree that given other buildings that were rebuilt and things that it could have been um, restored at the time. Um, but in the Russian zone of the divided Berlin, it wasn't. And then in 1950 and 1951, it was raised to the ground in what was seen as a dramatic symbolic statement of erasure of imperial history in one form at least. So a denial of a certain heritage. On the site, the German Democratic uh, Republic established its own governmental seat, uh, the Palace of the Republic. Um, nothing, I think, really dates quite as much as uh, futuristic utopian style. Um, this was also a space of leisure for the country's citizens, with a bowling alley, a cinema, restaurants, milk bar that I recall visiting, and disco that I missed. Um, so it was a very active statement at one level of social inclusion, um, actively counterpointed to that of the bourgeois Prussian palace, though perhaps those copper-tinted windows opaque from the outside uh, give lie to some of that tra purported transparency. After the fall of the wall, and German reunification, which saw Berlin become capital of uh, the whole of Germany again, debate began about what to do in this um, part of Berlin, uh, seen by many as the absolute symbolic uh, center, and therefore of the nation too. Um, that, that symbolic center was on account of the fact that the city palace, the Schloss, had been located there, as well as the new palace, but also that the surrounding area, which is called Museum Island, was especially heritage rich with many grand museums, and it was given UNESCO World Heritage status in 1990. Like a scar on the face of an angel was how an eminent West German art historian who I heard talking about the GDR Palace described it. Years of debate followed in which the government of the new Germany uh, decided first one way, then the other, um, and coupled with various protests, artistic interventions, uh, and so forth, um, decided in the end to dismantle uh, the palace. And uh, this occurred um, by, it was, it was kind of slowly between 2007 and 2011, uh, and was completed uh, by them. For some, uh, this was just the erasure of a pernicious totalitarian history. For others, for others, it was an active forgetting of their heritage and evil, even 
a denial of their perspective on that past. What then to build on the site was similarly contested, and to cut another quite complicated story short, what won out was a campaign by those who wanted to see the rebuilding of the Prussian palace. Um, and here is an artist's uh, impression. So Wilhelm von Bodin, a Hamburg businessman um, who led the campaign and put up some of his own cash to jumpstart um, public payment for the uh, facades, he talks in interviews very emotionally about his own childhood memories of seeing the Schloss, uh, first in its beautiful wholeness, and then, in very emotional terms, damaged and then no more. And many have joined him, uh, supporting the project financially, though not to the levels uh, needed, um, but also through their keen interest in the details of the physical restoration. But although that went ahead, it didn't do so unopposed. Perspectives located in the site's past erupted into the present. Those who objected to the destruction of the palace and of the, uh, the, the palace of the Republic objected to the Schloss reconstruction, as did many commentators and local people who thought that looking back in that way just wasn't the right approach in the new Germany. What grew particularly loud, however, was opposition to the Schloss on account of its colonial entanglements, a development that knitted the local together with the wider near global concern with the colonial that Anne Stoller pointed out in her opening keynote um, and that Katie Gardner and Luke Heslop uh, yesterday confirmed. So, I'm sorry, I don't know why that one's not so light. It's lighter on my screen. Anyway. Um, this was then amplified by the, de the decision that the building would house, among other things, objects and exhibitions from Berlin's Ethnological Museum, which is in effect uh, Germany's National Museum of Ethnology or Ethnography. Um, so objects that might have been and somehow have been acquired through colonial expropriation, um, but that could more generally be seen as gathered within European expansionist endeavor and grossly uneven power relations. So arguments legitimating the move by pointing out that some of the collections had originally been in the Schloss um, only added fuel uh, to the call for a moratorium on the whole building process. Now, by this stage, um, I'm sorry there's so much history, but it's picking bits out. Um, by this stage, the cultural complex um, of museums and event, event spaces that it was uh, to be, be housed within the Schloss have been named the Humboldt Forum. After the explorer and uh, naturalist Alexander von Humboldt and his older brother Wilhelm, um, who, who was Berlin's education minister, as well as being a scholar of language diversity. Now, that naming and populating of the building um, with what were usually referred to in Germany as the non-European collections, which actually also included those from the Museum of Asian Art as well as the uh, ethnological, and both of those museums were, which were in the suburbs were shut down uh, during the process, ready for things to go to the new Humboldt Forum. Um, Although that naming was part of a, a, a stated ambition of the project to link together as much of the world as possible, um, uh, it, it could be seen um, as well as part of a, a potentially problematic discourse uh, of uh, the world that's pervaded the project. So we, we see constant re references uh, in it uh, to, to the world, and that has a rather different um, potentiality. So on one hand it kind of gets used a bit like in uh, world music and tending to refer to everything except for classical Europe. Um, and on the other hand it's sort of in tension with a more globally encompassing sense of the world. And those two different senses are in some ways bound up with really very different readings, especially of Alexander von Humboldt. On the one hand is this kind of valiant European explorer, maybe the world's uh, first um, eco-warrior, 
uh, who tried to uh, emphasize global connectivity um, in a way that, uh, I including some uh, in, in uh, uh, envir environmentalists see as vi an interconnectivity that's vital to recover in light of the environmental challenge of the Anthropocene. On the other, um, as Mary Louise Pratt has most notably argued, he's seen as essentially a colonialist figure whose attempts to map uh, and gain a, a global view are seen as part of a, a dangerous um, Eurocentric bi uh, bid for world mastery. Now, next weekend is Alexander's 250th birthday, and there we have an interesting commemorative stamp brought out <laughs> for the occasion. And next weekend is when the Humboldt Forum was supposed to open. Um, but Germany seems to be beset with all sorts of temporal challenges, and uh, now it's going to be at least uh, a year before, before it does so which actually is really annoying for my research project, but I'll ignore that. <laughs> um, so what we see then in this um, case of the Schloss and the Humboldt Forum is this site of many histories and possibilities coming together. And actually, what it's really been in Germany is a catalyst for galvanizing debate about Germany's uh, past, and especially about colonialism, provenance, and restitution. Michael Rothberg, has, as m many people will know, has argued that memories don't need to be mutually exclusive. They don't need to be part of a zero-sum game. Um, but he, he talks of memory as multi-directional. So memories can spur each other, other, other on. They can proliferate and exist side by side in public space. And in some ways, more broadly, we do see precisely that but not always. And in the end, surely, there's only so much space, and some heritage ends up getting uh, more prominence than others. Well, as part of what could be seen as an attempt to salvage the Humboldt Forum from its, its begin beginnings and rather conservative tendencies, um, uh, wh one of the discourses that has emerged is that of multi-perspectivity. Um, a, a former PhD student of mine, the very brilliant Friedrich von Bose, or Fred as I will call him from now on, um, has uh, analysed uh, that for the early stages of the project, showing how in those early phases that idea of multi-perspectivity which of course has been a very important one in certain areas of um, museum uh, studies, how that became a key word for many of those who are arguing the case for why the non-European collections should enter the Humboldt Forum and how that would mean that the Humboldt Forum would differ from traditional ethnographic museums. So claims were made, for example, that the Humboldt Forum would be unique in having, and I quote, a constantly changing narrating position. But just how was much less clear. And what Fred's pointed out is that this kind of glorying in different positionalities tended to be disconnected from histories, especially, and I quote, histories of colonial exchange and entanglement, histories which lie at the heart of the modern project of ethnological collecting and exhibiting. As a result, he argues, the notion of multi-perspectivity becomes devoid of much of its possibly critical potential. Now, Fred has published on this in that book um, and also online uh, back in uh, 2013. That came out in 2016. Um, and as such, his work could be readily, easily read by some of those who've been busy designing the content of the Humboldt Forum. Uh, and indeed, Fred himself is now a curator of one part of the Humboldt Forum, a part that belongs to the Humboldt University, uh, for which I, too, work. Um, you can ask me about these things. <laughs> At this point, let me say a little bit about the research project that took me to Berlin in 2015, um, and this project, which is a, 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 a talk about as a multi-researcher uh, ethnography, um, in which this castle story that I talked about is part. 
Um, concerned not only with the Humboldt Forum, but more broadly with museum and heritage making of diverse kinds, with Berlin as kind of the focus, but we're interested in yeah, other places too, but our ethnographic focus is Berlin. We're especially concerned to look at the, um, the inclusions and exclusions and the models for performing uh, those, techniques of differencing, saming, and other forms of welding. Some of us are directly doing f uh, fieldwork uh, in the Humboldt Forum, and that includes me, and I've been hanging out especially with the team who are making an exhibition um, that is, I don't know if it stays with this name, has been called um, Berlin and the World. And um, that's an exhibition under the auspices of the city uh, museums of Berlin and various uh, staff uh, from there. Um, and it includes many people who have actually made their name already from doing very socially aware and critical uh, museum practice. So I've ended up looking at the Humboldt Forum, at least partly through their uh, critical vantage points, as they negotiate being part of the Humboldt Forum while trying to work against at least some of its grain. Now, I haven't got time to say much about uh, that now, but I want to just give you one just tiny uh, cameo of how I've benefited from their views, and in this case, their take on multi-perspectivity. So, on the one hand, what they did was they kind of embraced that as a keyword of the Humboldt Forum, and saw it as congruent with their aims um, to tell a plural story of Berlin, as made up of many peoples interconnected with many parts of the world, in positive, but also negative, and sometimes deeply ambivalent ways. But they were also aware of the problems of the term, and that came to be expressed especially um, clearly when working with the designers on the exhibition about what are called the visual metaphors for the exhibition. At one stage, what the designers suggested was a kaleidoscope as a sort of visual metaphor uh, for this multi-perspectivity multi through the exhibition. So kaleidoscope, all those nice colors that constantly reform, yeah, um, with that, that reshuffling. It seemed like it had a lot to recommend it. But the curatorial team rejected it. Um, as they already had, and you won't be so surprised, jungle and zoo, but we'll miss those. Um, they rejected it because they felt it made the, the perspective seem just a matter of rather random ways of seeing, instead of more specific shapes resulting from particular histories and socio-political differences. So instead, after months of discussion, and it really did go on a long time, they opted for a metaphor, and this, this is actually one along the way and isn't the final one, but of a more multi-dimensional, three-dimensional web, um, and one that visitors will partly co-construct, adding their own perspectives. But they're still not totally satisfied with that, having struggled with how to translate um, the German term Verflechtung, um, which is less really about a kind of point-to-point -point connection as if you, you draw lines, um, uh, but has built into it, it, so it can be translated maybe more as something like um, a, a weaving. And <coughs> so there have been lots of discussion how to translate it for the English version, in which actually some people here also <laughs> may, may, may have, in my team, made, made, made comments and you don't know this yet, they decided in the end to go for interconnection, even though that sort of sums up a little bit too much, maybe the point to point, but they felt that entanglement, which they knew the literature and were referring to that, would just wasn't a term that would work uh, for visitors, but they have this nice term, Verflechtung, in the German. Anyway, as you can see from this crazy list, I absolutely love this, um, this is, these are the, projects, uh, the sub-projects in this uh, project that I'm leading in Berlin, uh, this Making Differences uh, project. And you can see that there's, it's impossible to read, I know, but you can see, hopefully, that there's lots of um, quite varied uh, work uh, going on. And that is both purposeful and a little bit um, uh, contingent at the same time. So most of the researchers have been trained at least to some extent in anthropology, though we have quite a lot of different anthropologies there with various degrees of archival training, 
Um, and we also have some particular expertise in visual anthropology and art. And although I don't want to um, romanticize a sort of an artistic perspective, the alertness, I think, to the visual and sometimes other forms of the sensory that researchers uh, trained in those traditions bring absolutely undoubtedly enriches our multiple and co constantly mutually engaged and reformulating uh, perspectives. So although only some of these directly work on the Humboldt Forum, others uh, impinge on it, uh, in, or it on them, in uh, various ways. So what we can kind of say is that what we're doing is what in, uh, in Germany gets called uh, looking quer, and quer means kind of obliquely or askance, and I think we could say queerly uh, as well um, at it. And if I just pick out um, two of the team members here, uh, who are here, <laughs> uh, who are doing this. So um, Jonas Tinius, uh, who has been looking at smaller alternative uh, galleries which sometimes characterize their approach against the Humboldt Forum and who are often very concerned with finding new positions, perhaps deploying art uh, for thinking difference in other, other ways. And Magda, Mag Magdalene Bucic, uh, she's working at the Museum of European Cultures, a museum that ended up excluded uh, from the Humboldt Forum developments, left behind is how it's often talked. And what her exploration of the collections shows is that uh, uh, her exploration of collections that tend to be forgotten uh, in the contemporary post-colonial uh, focus shows um, is other histories and connections with other parts of the world and stories and worldings that might also have been brought to the center but haven't, at least not yet. And I, I should say that we also have other researchers in our centre working not formally on this project, but who enrich it in other ways. Um, hello, Alisa, at that point. Um, let me then, in the very short time, no, I'm not so short, shortish time remaining, uh, mention a couple of um, examples of work that um, actually will result directly in some displays in the Humboldt Forum uh, itself. And I have to say, this was not something that was planned at the beginning of the project. And I work in a context where we're deliciously free of having to do impact. So this is no impact case study. This has just emerged out of, um, out of the work and things that seemed like a good idea because, of, because they did, because they did, which is a luxury. Um, so one of these. Um, is a project that's really right at the beginning called Who is ID 8470? Um, and that's l led by um, uh, one of our researchers called Tal Adler, who always introduces himself uh, as an artist. And this is work that um, will go into uh, the, the hub, the university's uh, area of the Humboldt Forum. And that idea has been developed in close collaboration uh, with Fred Friedrich von Bosa, among others. It also draws on a model of work that um, Tal devised for a European um, Horizon 2020 project that we finished recently, a project called uh, Traces. And uh, I've put up its website if you want to have a look at it. That had at its heart a kind of idea of, well, looking at contentious or difficult heritage but doing so, trying to get away from that model where artists come along and they're supposed to make an intervention. They come in, make the intervention and go. What this did, and this is the co-production uh, there and what we call creative co-productions in, in the project, they entailed cultural institutions and artists and ethnographers working together in teams on specific, uh, specific problems um, and, uh, and developing p particular products or ways of dealing things. It was a project, again, we didn't know what those would be at the beginning. So sometimes they're exhibitions, sometimes they were databases and uh, so on. So, um, yeah, so that was part of the, the background uh, to, uh, the, uh, to developing this particular um, project. And it did draw especially on a part of that Traces project called Dead Images, which had to do uh, 
uh, with human skull collections in the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And I, I can talk more about that project if you like. But what this one um, will do is it begins with a, a skull um, of unknown origin, at least unknown at the moment, and we'll find out from research whether uh, just well how far we can uh, get with it. It's part of the university collections, and it's one of these, um, uh, as you can see, skulls with uh, drawings on from uh, Francis Gall's theory of organology, which later came to be known as phrenology. Now, one of the things that came up in the Traces project uh, was questions uh, which partly came um, from uh, working with various indigenous communities about showing um, uh, skulls. And so as, as, as Tal already thinks he probably will not actually show the skull, which also opens up some very interesting uh, ways of thinking about questions of perspective and where, they are, uh, where they're focusing uh, on. But for that reason, I, I covered uh, it here as well. Um, so the work... So, th so the idea will be to work with that skull and, and really see the range of different uh, stories that might be uh, brought uh, to bear upon it, ranging from um, racial, uh, scientific uh, histories and, and others. We'll see where it goes. Um, the work will also involve those who um, Erica Lehrer, who is part of our Traces project, uh, calls communities of implication a more expansive term than that source community uh, term that's so often uh, used. So in that way, there will be a kind of conscious deployment of multi-perspectival, but heeding the warnings uh, from Fred's own critical analysis and from the Traces project. So the aim will not be to be kaleidoscopic, but a more curated, historyful, and implicated plurality. Right, one quick other <laughs> Uh, project uh, here. So, um, so this project, um, I'll give it its full title here, so Confronting Colonial Pasts, Envisioning Cre Creative Futures, um, uh, is, is a project that's currently in the making. And it, where, it's, it, it, what it's, where its origins are, uh, we're actually from a proposal that was made at a, a research workshop uh, that we held in Berlin, uh, where we brought together researchers, our researchers, some other researchers, researchers from various uh, countries, some of you here, I think, um, and also museum and heritage professionals, mainly from Berlin, but also elsewhere. Um, and actually, I'll go forwards and backwards. An idea that was expressed at that uh, conference, and I know there's too much text to read, but you can go and download free from our website um, the, the, the booklet that we produced about, about the, um, uh, the, the, the workshop. So Larissa Furster, who um, is one of our researchers and who uh, has been working on questions of colonial provenance in Germany, uh, for a, a long time, and she's been very active as well in doing things like um, uh, contributing to the writing of the guidelines for the German Museum um, as Association on uh, objects in their, their collections. Uh, she's actually just left our project um, uh, to actually head up a new section of the German Lost Art Foundation, which is something that was set up particularly to trace um, art that had been looted by the Nazis, but she's setting up a new section in Berlin on uh, colonial provenance, and we'll continue to work closely uh, with her. Um, and that, again, is a, an example of a kind of fluid relationship. We never knew things would go that way, uh, but that's how it's going. But anyway, the core of her proposal was to set objects free. And uh, she asks there, um, yeah, so what if we set objects free as a methodology? Now, her suggestion um, fell onto open ears of um, a curator, well, yeah, of particularly one curator from the Ethnological Museum, uh, Jonathan Fine, who was present at our workshop, 
um, and who is already engaged in uh, questions of colonial provenance of the objects and in discussion with various uh, African museums. So he's the curator, of, uh, one of the curators for Africa, and especially um, a program called Africa Accessioned. Um, but the project has now begun and it's got funding from the um, Gerd Henkel Stiftung, Gerd, Gerd Henkel Stiftung. Um, and what it's entailed is a, um, a group uh, of what they, they call in their uh, terminology a group of stakeholders uh, from various uh, communities of implication and also from the National Museum of uh, Namibia who've come to Berlin and they've uh, selected about 20 objects and there's a few of them um, and then taken them to the National uh, Museum where, of National Museum of Namibia where they're undergoing conservation work um, I have to tell you, there's a, these things often, there are, there are twists along the way. And one of them here that sort of complicated the process is that these are really pretty poisonous. And the reason they're poisonous is because of all the conservation materials uh, that have been used on them. And that is the case for very, very many uh, objects in museum collections. So what will happen with them is they'll go to... Um, uh, Namibia with conservation experts and there will be training in uh, conservation techniques which is something the National Museum uh, wanted as part of uh, the process. What then happens and apparently um, you can remove some but you're always going to need masks and gloves to work with them. Uh, what then happens is that the, these objects, and they're, they're mostly textiles and jewellery, uh, is that artists uh, in Namibia will work uh, with those, and they're going to produce some new objects, um, and those objects will go into a new national museum of fashion uh, that's currently uh, being built in Namibia. And then, um, at least uh, some exhibition about this and uh, some artwork and it's already decided the particular piece that refers uh, to the remembrance of German colonial violence and destruction will come back into uh, a future display in the Humboldt Forum. So there's a couple of ongoing projects. Both of these projects then are ones that kind of gathered their own momentum and in various ways um, have seen unanticipated twists and turns and there may be more to come. They're a methodology, a recursive one, to use a term um, that Jonas, Jonas Tinius and I have used in a recent paper in a, a, a volume called The Anthropologist as Curator that's due out sometime or other, soon I think. Um, both projects um, are likely to be criticised for not doing enough, and even for participating at all in the Tainted Humboldt Forum. They're not, they're not, they're not a storming of the castle walls or a tearing down of the castle. All the same, I, I think, they're, a, they're minor but not insignificant insurgencies. They grasp a chance to unsettle existing perspectives and practice, and to bring other ways of seeing and doing into what will be a much visited public space. A couple of final comments. On perspectives and multi-perspectivity, I've tried to argue for modes of engaging different positions, but without flattening them out or kaleidoscoping them into merely colorful patterns. That deeper, more engaged perspectival plurality, anthropology is basically brilliant at that. I think it's the uh, core of, uh, of what we do. And the world and the future need our expertise in detecting and articulating diverse perspectives and including sometimes quite subtle shifts of position. At the same time though, and in the face of the disturbing and relentless developments that I mentioned at the beginning and that have been 
yeah, mentioned in all uh, previous keynotes and plenaries and many, many panels too. Um, in the face of, uh, of those, we need as many thoughtful and creative hands on deck as possible. And we need new and repurposed methodologies to grasp the opportunities available to unsettle pernicious ways of seeing and doing and to meet the global challenge of ensuring that there will be a future and hopefully an equitable, livable and creative one. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. That was a lovely, uh, a wide-ranging uh, exposition on um, the multiple perspectives that uh, will be emerge or are emerging and will be emerging at the Humboldt Forum. Um, so there's a, there's a whole range of uh, of subjects that have been have been raised here um, on methodology, anthropological methodolo methodology, on curation, um, insurgencies, and other ways of seeing. Um, it reminds me of um, what perhaps is um, a defining characteristic of, of the museum or the archive in general, namely that it is a, a utopian space. Um, an archive is, of course, never complete. It's always um, uh, in the process of being made. And, of course, the process of decolonization in that is, is uh, a, a, one of our, the most recent iterations of, of the uh, tasks that one could, uh, could set for this, for this archive. Um, maybe that's, maybe you, would, uh, you would like to ask some questions. Uh, Sharon is, Sharon is uh, ready to, uh, to, ask, to answer your questions. Thank you. There's a, there's a question over there at the back. <laughs> Hello. Um, so in your talk, you spoke mostly about confronting the uh, colonial legacy of these collections. But I was wondering, what about the um, absence or erasure of the Palace of the Republic in the GDR? Um, because I work in Eastern Germany, and that's something that figures really prominently in narrative of Eastern Germans about their own erasure from the, let's say, national body of, of history. So I was wondering whether in these research projects there is any space for that. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely part of the story. And so, um, One of the things, and particularly from within the Berlin exhibition that I've been looking at, has been about that question of, yeah, where the um, uh, GDR figures in, in what will be presented. Um, there is a whole warehouse of all the stuff out of the um, Palace of the Republic uh, in Berlin. So there's also very interesting questions about what you decide to get out of that particular physical archive and uh, and put in. So, yeah, it is something um, that we're looking at. And I, and I think, actually, Magda's research, uh, not particularly the Palace of the Republic, but the questions of um, uh, GDR uh, history. And it's relative, yeah. It's not, it's to say sidelined is the wrong, wrong term, but it, yeah, where it manages to uh, emerge and not is, is definitely um, one of, part, part of the story. And in that turning of the space into one, primarily with the non-European collections at that point, that was seen very much as a removal of the space of that history. And it was in the plans at that point restricted to a sort of little basement area about the history of the space. That's kind of changed a bit, um, and there is uh, 
reference to the Palace of the Republic and so on in the Berlin exhibition. A little bit remains to be seen um, how much of that is there. Yes, thank you, Sharon. I have uh, two questions, really. Uh, one is to do with the relationship of the development of this project with other grand museum complexes around the world and to what extent they fed off that. Because I know Neil McGregor was involved in this to a certain extent. And the title was it that the world, the world at home in the heart of Berlin and museum for the world of the world, the British Museum sort of logo, although that's going to be dumped soon, I hear. So that's one issue. To what extent the, the conditions for the development of this project were, were actually global at that, at that level. Second question is, if you could reflect on some of the anxieties, perhaps, of the curators involved in this, past and present, who have had basically been told to get on with it, mm -hmm. uh, and to what extent the tensions there between the management project side and the curators on the ground, to what extent have they had or have had any influence in how this has been developed as a project? That's a big question. Um, beginning with the first one, yeah, it was it was the the first development of the the, the, the project was very very much um, looking to certain key museums and documents were produced which were talking about um, especially Cape Only that that became a real um, I, I mean I think at first there was an idea that could simply be emulated uh, in Berlin but there's a there's a document that kind of also refers to all the big museum projects around the world and says, hmm, next one, Berlin, Humboldt Forum. So that was very much part of it. And when Neil McGregor um, was brought in, to use the language that's usually uh, used to um, uh, head up the founding directorship of the Humboldt Forum at that, that point, that was also seen as, yeah, as part of this, this um, global networking and yeah, acquisition of global expertise for, for the, the, the Humboldt Forum. And the, yeah, the, the discourse of, of world permeates in all kinds of ways, and that was definitely entangled in it. The issue of the curators um, and relationships with management and so on, I have to say here that the Humboldt Forum, I sometimes, I sometimes say it's Humboldt Forum soup, it's got so many ingredients, and so the and and so it, it's it's not like a museum. So it has a whole set of uh, different governmental um, uh, agencies for different parts. So the Berlin exhibition that I look at, that's under um, the city of Berlin uh, gov government structure. The um, the uh, ethnological museum and the Museum of a Asian Art are under something called the State Museums of Berlin and the um, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, which is a national organization, even though it has the term Prussian, um, or because it does, sort of. Uh, so it depends. I suspect you really mean the ethnological museum, <laughs> which is what anthropologists mostly are uh, interested in. Um, the, the curators often find themselves uh, being criticised, and there's been a lot of different uh, phases um, in the procedure, and there's been turnover of people as well. So it's really, really difficult to just say um, one uh, one thing there. Um, and yeah, there have been different struggles within, and uh, but with uh, also what. I, yeah. Let me think what I, am I being filmed? Yeah, maybe. I mean, just can you be a bit, a bit careful here. Um, let me think how to say this. It's not that sort of question. No, I mean, babe. It's a structural question of how curators have been able to deal with the histories, because they know the histories of their collections and the problems with them. There's a sense yeah. Of them. Part of Partly, and, and so developments like that one that I mentioned at the end, in some ways that was there a curator grasping a possibility to do some of the kind of work that, um, and enough people to support that, uh, that he had kind of wanted to do. It gave a sort of voice uh, to that. And I think there's quite a lot of examples um, of that. But some of it has been a little bit running to catch up because I, 
I think that the um, critique of it was experienced as um, unexpected in some ways by the curators. And curators who thought they were doing a very good thing um, found themselves uh, feeling often very um, attacked and so on. So that's be, uh, yeah, been part of the context. But you can wait for the Ethnological Museum, you can wait for Margarete von Oswald's um, uh, ethnography down, down at the bottom there of, of the museum. She really um, was absolutely uh, in, in, embedded there in the museum uh, in some of the most difficult uh, times of its uh, development. Hang on, there's a, quest there's a question at the back, at left, yes. Hi. Sharon, Hi. thank Hi. you. Am I on? Yes. I can hear you. Sharon, thank you for that. It's really, and thank you for putting that um, slide back up because it's really wonderful hearing about the, the massive diversity within this project that is all being somehow hung together <laughs> um, and really how exciting it is. Um, but I wanted to ask you whether you could say a little bit more about this multi-perspectival approach. So you've already talked about, you know, the kind of, it's not a radical alterity ontological position, neither is it a kaleidoscope of perspectives. Um, and I really like this idea of like a very small shifts that make a different perspective. So I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that overarching concept, basically. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose I was doing kind of two things. One is looking at it in the field as it manifests itself and where I, I suppose the term is done in a problematic way. And then at the same time wanting to recover um, a version of it where um, there is an openness to a plurality of perspectives, but without um, chopping them off uh, from particularly what's formed them uh, and, and, and so on. So I suppose if I'm thinking about um, something like how would you manifest that through an exhibition, like if it's the, um, with, with this one, um, and in this one, because we're kind of, yeah, you working with that as a, an idea. We want as well, so sometimes what happens in museological ways of thinking about it is a, is a kind of idea of a stable object as well, that you're just poking different perspectives at, kind of. Um, and, and so we want to, because we remove the op object in this case, it'll be a sort of absent presence, um, is to really, th in some ways, really think about what it means to bring different uh, views together. But I suppose one of the points where it gets, when, when you, you are putting in the questions of the histories and the locatedness, um, is then... Are you, what legitimacy are you giving to different ones? And one of the potential problems with multi-perspectivity is that it, it pretends a sort of universal, any views, and it flattens them to the same. And that can be political uh, as well. And how you deal with, with curating that, I think, is, 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 a, is a problem, really. And in some ways, it, you know, it is, it's a bit like the, the old cultural relativism problems for anthropology. Uh, there and um, there have been in this uh, work questions about okay, what about very objectionable perspectives? Are we going to include uh, those as well? So, our, I guess the argument I'm wanting to uh, get to is for recognizing the plurality but locating it, and that as well can entail evaluation of which are closing off other perspectives and which are allowing those to be ex expressed as well. But I don't know if that gets anywhere to what you want. <laughs> yes. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Sharon. That was such a wonderfully interesting thing. I'm probably going to get another question that's going to just ask you to talk a bit more about, about something. But uh, as you know, my son's a museum curator and he complains all the time that curators have become an inconvenience because they know things <laughs> and complains bitterly about all the mediators. But I, I, I'd like to ask you about the, the, the mediations that, that transmit these controversies and critiques into this field of action. I mean, where are they exactly are they coming from and how do they get transmitted through what I imagine is quite a complicated managerial structure to, to then get debated, presumably, by the, by the curators themselves in part at any rate. So I mean, how, how exactly does that work as a kind of politics? Um, I think what our research has definitely showed is it works really differently in some of the different locations. Um, so speaking for the Berlin exhibition, they really debate the stuff. They bring the debates in. They might have the, the things that have come out in the news uh, and so on. Um, they bring in diversity training experts to talk to them, to discuss. So they really, really, um, uh, yeah, grasp it from wherever. And that's partly why I think they quite liked having an anthropologist hang out as well. So they're very, very keen to, um, yeah, find out what are the, um, I mean, partly many of them knew already because they uh, have attend conferences on critical museology and, uh, and, and also going on visits to places and evaluating those. That was very much part of the, uh, the, the process as well. Um, other parts, and I think it is something that makes a difference between them, so because we're looking at quite a lot of different locations, that simply doesn't happen anything like that ever. And there is a, a sort of traditional model of curators as their own, having their own fiefdoms and they just do their thing. And some of them may be going to conferences and reading about things, but they m might also not do so. So that is, is an area that, yeah, there is a lot of, a lot of variety. Hi, Sharon. Thanks so much uh, for your talk. Uh, it's obviously a really complex project that engages um, with so many different nodes of bureaucratic structure, but also kind of so much contested politics. And I think some of the questions have already touched on that. I'd just like to ask you, uh, perhaps if you could expand a little bit more about the CCP model that mm -hmm. is part of the project, this creative co-production, um, and how uh, such work, and this is actually the slide right here, isn't it? How such work perhaps addresses some of these difficulties, some of these questions, uh, and how perhaps it brings something to your project which, uh, if your project was not configured in this way, it might not be able to address. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, this was really at the heart of this other project that, um, yeah, though they have big intersections, uh, thinking what to say about it. I mean, just to give a little bit of background, so it's one of these European projects, so numerous partners in different countries, and it worked from, uh, well, it had a, a very diverse set of um, contentious heritages. So uh, Tal, as part of a, a, a team, looked at um, this collection that's actually more than 40,000 uh, human skulls in the Natural History Museum in Vienna, and there's also a great photo library, and the museum, uh, yeah, really didn't know what uh, to do with that. We also had um, our Slovenian death masks, um, uh, artworks produced by uh, non-Jewish uh, Poles about the Holocaust, which are in Krakow Museum, um, an abandoned synagogue in Transylvania, and and so on, uh, as 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 cases. And these in these, so so the idea was that in this that it would be a kind of more sustainable working, and there would be a kind of attempt not just of of, of you know the artist goes in, 
and leaves, or you just work for... On the one hand, there was close working on a particular um, uh, problem and, uh, and, and, and so on. But the idea was also to create some more sustainable change in those organisations because of, yeah, people... I, uh, well, it, yeah, the idea that people would really appreciate the ways of working and that the ethnographers there would, would also be doing this kind of work of making explicit of what was going on uh, in, in the process. And in some cases, I think it worked really well. I was really stunned by a conference where, um, uh, with the, with the uh, Dead Images, the, the Skulls Project, where biological anthropologists from the museum um, just talked about how they really had totally changed their practice because they had not seen, I mean, these, they, they had seen themselves as working with specimens and actually because the project also brought um, them together uh, with um, uh, some Maori uh, uh, representatives and um, uh, Native American ones and that experience of so how that project worked really made the um, uh, biological anthropologists feel they needed to treat their collections in different different ways. So it, it, it seemed to be a model that um, opened up, yeah, a, a new kinds of possibilities. Sometimes it didn't work, but that was pretty um, interesting too. Yeah. And I think the thing that you it was create you're creating something new as well. That you, it, so there was because it's a new project. You got to come out with some sort of public something, <laughs> even if it wasn't determined what. And the, but that sort of gave it a focus and uh, worked in that way. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your um, presentation. It's really inspiring because I also think about the word object and uh, to think about an anthropology of the contemporary, I was just wondering, uh, it's very fascinating, but I don't want to reduce the concept object to the material. And as much as we are now reinventing or rethinking the idea or the concept of the archive, I'm just wondering in the contemporary world, can we, what is it that we don't, do not need to archive? Is there something that we don't have to archive? Is, can there be a movement against anti-archiving? Why I ask this is sort of specific, because five days ago in a place where I come from, 1.9 million citizens have become stateless overnight because they couldn't prove their identity through a document. Uh, that the, people, the state wanted a document and uh, an, evident, an evidence of relation to a document in 1951 or 71, right? But we need to recognize 1.9 million people as also having been, uh, having been a citizen and what is their status now because they cannot prove their citizenship through an archive. So as much as the material points to the idea of a location, and that is multi-perspectival, of course, we recognize that, the material also is indexical of something. And I think the notion of an index in the contemporary is changing. So I'm just wondering, we recognize the making of an archive is continuous, and it should be that. Do we, need, do we not need to archive something? Just to, just to invite your comment on that. Mm, so in that, I guess I hear the question about, um, yeah, what happens if something isn't archived, um, but also, it, I, I'm, prob I'm probably reading this into your question, um, but another project that I didn't mention because I suffered from its effects um, is uh, a, a, a within a, a, an AHRC project that also finished this year. It's been a bit of a mad year. Um, uh, called Heritage Futures, and I was um, uh, leading this part of it called Profusion, where basically the kind of question was, um, where do you stop? What what do you not archive? And um, and we, we're looking there at. Um, uh, particularly museums of everyday life, so in the UK, especially small localish museums, um, and what they decided to keep uh, for the future. But we also looked in people's own homes about um, their uh, ideas about what what do they keep. And uh, although we didn't mean to, we just kept the project. Just kept turning into um, how do people get rid of stuff? 
how do they um, put it in these out-of-town storage centers? And we found museums are pretty much uh, doing that. Museums are really bothered now um, about, yeah, is it okay to sell stuff off or to, they quite like sometimes the idea of it being repurposed for recycling and, uh, and, and so on. So um, the question of, yeah, what can we not archive, I think is a massive question of our times in all sorts of ways because there is an idea that maybe we should keep everything. Um, and uh, the digital, I think, gives us the sense that that's possible, even though actually digital stuff is usually the first to not not survive. But you raised this other question, though, actually sometimes really, yeah, serious side effects of what doesn't doesn't get archived, which um, was in, in a way what pushes towards then this, this, this archiving. But yeah, it doesn't need to, yeah, the object you asked about as well. Um, yeah, I mean, in, um, yeah, I mean, it can be, I, I mean, if we look at heritage as a, as a phenomenon, intangible cultural heritage has become uh, increasingly at this sort of center of uh, the gaze. So it could, it doesn't, need to be the object, but there needs to be some kind of trace, of course, yeah. Mm. I think we have time for one more question. And there's, there's Emma, there's someone close to you. Thank you, Sharon, for that marvelous presentation, very thought-provoking. Um, I wanted to just refer back to a couple of the earlier questions and see if I could ask you to try to stitch them together. Um, not knowing anything about this part of the world, I was visiting somewhere near Warsaw about five years ago and was shown a place um, in this village where um, the, uh, the Grand Synagogue had been and was told by the local residents how um, where I was standing in the middle of a road had been where the synagogue was and that this was a, a, a predominant practice. The Not only the the raising of buildings, but then the replacement of something else there, so you would never know it had been there. And um, it struck me when you were describing the dual sort of destruction and recreation of the Schloss that there was something uh, familiar in that, in those acts. So um, what I was wondering about is when you talk of multi-perspectives, um, whether there isn't also some sort of a problem of scale as well, because it seems to me that all the wonderful projects you described are essentially trying to look at the curation, so they're, they're about the contents of these collections, but there's something also going on in terms of the spatial history of the structures in which these collections are contained. <laughs> Um, which perhaps disappears in turn too, because it's not made up of those material artifacts, whether or not they're co-created. So I just wondered if you could reflect on that mm. at all. So this, the, um, just thinking the, the direction. Yeah, no, thanks very much for that. I, th I think, yeah, the scale of it. So, um, I think one thing that's really interesting is which become the ones that are selected for retention and which are not. So many things just kind of do get vanished, if you like. Um, and I mean, in the case of, of Poland, there's been a really interesting project of trying to um, yeah, rediscover the traces of um, all sorts of Jewish presence by uh, Jonathan Weber. And it's, and he set up a whole museum in Krakow about, about this and of the Galician Jews. And that, that's very, very, very um, interesting, really, really poignant, um, poignant case. So, um, I mean, the, in, the, in this, I think in Germany, mostly there's a lot of attentiveness to these questions, precisely because of the histories of erasure. Um, Having said that, things do still, um, yeah, get vanished, but they're, they're much less likely to. So I suppose there's different moments and different cases. In some ways, I could probably answer that better, thinking about some of my earlier work on um, 
on, on Nazi sites and what remained and when, and you really have very different approaches at different uh, times uh, to uh, to those those very very questions and just yeah whether you try to retain things just in photographic form or the physical structures and so on which is maybe what you mean by uh, by scale and there's very interesting issues there as well about the kinds of materiality and which things decay faster in what kinds of ways as well and also transportability of photos you can um, move and store elsewhere the spaces are, are just yeah where they were thank you so thank you thank you sharon for uh, this uh, this fascinating uh, uh lecture on on actually a work in progress um and so we get to get uh, a view of how, um, how uh, in the museum new, new futures are being crafted in, in Germany, which is uh, quite a, a privilege, I think, to be, to be part of. You so thank visit, you. You can come and visit it when it opens. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell us when, we can, when, we can, when, when it's open. Um, so it's a, um, before, I st before, before I ask an applause for, for um, Sharon, can I just mention that uh, Emma is going to have uh, some more housekeeping notes for you. And, yeah? Yeah, you yeah. thank you so much, Sharon. That was wonderful. This is my final reminder, I promise you, to celebrate this wonderful lecture. We have fine dining and fine dancing. Um, those of you who are going to the gala dinner and those of you who want to go to the alternative venues or if you just want to go into the city, um, to eat. The buses are leaving at 6.30, so you do have time to go and uh, freshen up a bit, stretch, um, get your dancing shoes on. Um, and the place that the buses will be is outside the drama studio, which is between number 11 and I think it's 14 on your map. Um, but just basically follow the crowd and look out for the volunteers. Okay, so see you all tonight. So, can I ask you to uh, once more thank uh, Sharon for